But brothers and sisters, we have come to Washington today for a reason. We have come to Washington today for a reason that inspires people of many generations to come to this same place. We have come to Washington today for a reason that has inspired our movement for life from the beginning and will inspire it until its goal is accomplished. We come to Washington for a reason that has inspired other movements for justice, for life, for equality. A reason that inspired the people that again gathered in so many places just this past Monday as our nation observed the federal holiday in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. I was in Atlanta with Dr. Alveda King of our Priest for Life team and her family and many veterans of the Civil Rights Movement were there and many of its greatest preachers and orators were there as well delivering not just two hours of prayer, praise, and preaching like we're going to have here today, but over four and a half hours of the same. But friends, it didn't feel like four and a half hours because we were lifted up. We were lifted up by the great ideals that inspired this nation from its beginning. That we do have rights that come from God, not government. That we know what those rights are. And that we live in a land and under a system of government where those rights can actually be preserved against the forces of evil, against the will of tyrants, that those rights can actually be preserved and that if they are infringed, there's a way to correct that. There's a way to stand up against that. There's a way to protest that. And to do it peacefully and effectively without revolution, without bloodshed, if we use the means that have been given us and one of those means is that we make our presence known here in the seat of power of this federal government. That we make our presence known, that we let our voices be heard. And as Martin Luther King Jr. said to those in the civil rights movement, the stomp, stomp, stomp of marching feet is the way that justice proceeds, especially in the face of intolerable injustice. Stomp, stomp, stomp of marching feet. We're here. We're here with our fellow citizens from all over the nation. We are here to do precisely that. Because we are here, as our brothers and sisters in the civil rights movement were here, to cash in on a check. A check, unfortunately, that has come back from our government marked insufficient funds. You remember when our brothers and sisters in the civil rights movement said this? They said, we've come here to cash in on the promise of our founding fathers, on the promise of this nation, and somehow, the nation is telling us there are insufficient funds for our rights to be recognized, for our participation in society to be realized, for our place in this great nation to be afforded to us in an equal way as it is to our other brothers and sisters. We protest because we refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the vaults of freedom and justice in America. So our brothers and sisters marched in this very city. They rallied in this very city for that purpose, fueled by that ideal. Brothers and sisters, are we here today on that same basis? Are we here today for that same purpose? Do we believe that there are still funds in the vaults of America. Do we believe that there are and 
enough funds in the vaults of freedom and justice in America to give life to our brothers and sisters in the womb, to protect them against violence. That is why we march. It is a simple demand, as simple as it is profound. That there can be no America, there can be no freedom for any group of people when freedom is denied to any other group of people. We are in this together. This is not just about protecting one group of people. This is about saying if they're not protected, and if our nation thinks it can move forward by continuing to fail to protect them, then you know what? We are all in danger. If their lives are not secure, neither are ours. Neither are ours. Because we're standing on the same basis. On the same basis. By what basis are you recognized as human? If somebody denied your humanity, how would you prove it? Would you give them a DNA sample? From your skin? From your hair? How would you prove your humanity? to those who would deny it. And whatever way you would use, brothers and sisters, to prove your humanity, we can prove the humanity of the brothers and sisters we march for today. And if a nation can have a blind spot so deep, a blind spot so stubborn, that even in the light of the science we have today that we have never had before, even in the light of knowledge we have of the unborn child, knowledge that we have more of from the time of Roe v. Wade until today than we ever had in human history, if despite that clear evidence our nation can have a blind spot so stubborn that the unborn still remain unprotected, then mark my words, it can turn a blind eye to you and me as well. Because the evidence is just as clear, just as conclusive, that these children are of the same humanity as we are. It cannot be more clear. And brothers and sisters, our nation does have a blind spot, and I go back again to Monday to that beautiful oratory that we experienced in Atlanta, Georgia, at the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church where Martin Luther King himself preached. We heard preaching on Monday. We heard people get up there and say the very words that I just said to you. If freedom is denied to any group of people, it cannot be promoted for anybody else. Those words were spoken in Ebenezer Baptist Church. You know what else was said? by the keynote speaker on Monday. What was said there was it is a heretical notion to think that some lives are more valuable than other lives. It was also said there that what is at issue here is not simply the cause of African Americans but the cause of human life itself. What was said there after litanies of social evils were recited one after another after another, it was said there that the summary of everything that was being proclaimed was that it's simply wrong to kill human beings. Period. That's what was said there. And everyone applauded and everyone stood up and people were jumping up in the air and people were saying amen. Elected officials were there. Media personalities were there. Cultural influencers in the black community were there. And they too marched. And they marched on the streets of Atlanta. And they marched all across the country and many of us were with them, as we should be. But brothers and sisters, there was a blind spot in that ceremony on Monday. There was a gap. Not a word was spoken about the unborn. Not a syllable was uttered about those against whom the most massive outpouring of violence is currently happening. Are we living in a different world than our brothers and sisters with whom I worshipped and prayed on Monday in Atlanta? Are we somehow living in a different country where perhaps this isn't a problem? 
Or are we living in the very same nation in which thousands of times a day and let's talk about what this is not in some kind of abstract terms in which thousands of times a day as abortionists have testified under oath a heart can still be beating as it gets sucked through the catheter and into the collection jar it can still be beating for up to a minute after that body of that child is sucked out into the suction tube in a suction abortion in the first trimester of pregnancy the heart or as we go forward in pregnancy as our United States Supreme Court has even acknowledged that legs and arms are torn off of living children piece by piece that as again abortionists Martin Haskell, Warren Hearn and others have testified and written about in medical textbooks that skulls are brought out piece by piece rather than as a unified whole dismemberment abortion not the actions of some kind of barbaric terrorist not the actions that violate the law and for which one in these great United States of America might be thrown in jail not the actions that law enforcement in this great country might try to stop but actions indeed declared by the highest court to be legal are we living in the same country as those who can stand up and say that there ought not to be the taking of innocent life by gun violence or drug violence or any kind of violence the same country that will say that we must protect ourselves from the wicked will of terrorists who have no regard for innocent human life and at the same time they have this absolutely rigid blind spot to the unborn we're here for a purpose today we're here in the United States Capitol to say the blindness will end we don't have that blind spot we can see and that's not an expression of arrogance that's not saying we're better than anybody else no by no means we don't come to Washington for the March for Life out of self-righteousness because we don't believe that we're better than anybody else we just know when that God God gives us sight and he gives us insight that we have responsibility to respond that's why we're here we're not here because we're better when God lets us know we must act that's why we march we march with compassion today not just compassion for those babies being torn apart legally we are the ones who march with compassion for the women who are in such desperate straits they don't get abortions because of freedom of choice they get abortions because they feel they have no freedom and no choice and we understand that because we walk with them and we minister to them and we reach out to them and we provide help for them there are five times as many pregnancy centers in the United States as there are abortion facilities. And we are the ones providing the choice to women. Let nobody say we don't understand the circumstances of these women. The people marching on this march today are the people who operate the pregnancy centers across the United States and who serve the networks of those centers. We in pro-life leadership help to train these people and recruit them day after day and sustain them spiritually. We know what we're talking about when we speak about these mothers and the despair that fills our hearts we're not marching today because we want to take people's rights away we're marching today because we want to take away their despair that's what we're doing this is a movement that replaces despair with hope because hope gives you the strength to say yes to life hope given to those who feel they have no freedom and no choice and therefore go to the abortion clinic and a hope to those brothers and sisters and we will see them again today who are in despair because of the abortion that has already occurred. They will be here with us too. 
I have the privilege of being the pastoral director for the world's largest ministry for healing after abortion. And Rachel's Vineyard continues to grow in this nation and around the world, especially now in this year of mercy, where the church is proclaiming even more loudly, even more clearly, that we who reject abortion do not reject those who have had abortions. We embrace them with forgiveness and love and mercy and compassion. They're marching with us today too. You've seen them, you'll see them again today. I regret my abortion. The men, I regret lost fatherhood. And the children, I mourn my aborted sibling. They will be holding the signs. And the grandparents, I mourn my aborted grandchild. Look for them today. You'll see people with signs that say, I regret providing abortions. I regret performing abortions. These are all part of our Silent No More campaign. And brothers and sisters, their voices are becoming louder than ever. And there is no way the abortion industry can turn those voices off. No way. It'll only grow. Because with every passing day, the wound expands to more and more people. Do you think their voices can be silenced? There is absolutely nothing that the abortion forces can do to silence those voices. There is absolutely nothing that the pro-abortion members of Congress and the pro-abortion members of the executive branch or of the judicial branch can do Despite their own blindness, nothing they can do to keep those voices from rising up like a mighty tidal wave. You will see them and hear them again today. Well, brothers and sisters, the blind spot continues. It continues, and we continue to bear witness against it. You know, I was reflecting in the intercessions that we had today for our nation and for our nation's leaders that we're going to have to change the wording of our prayer service next year. We're going to have this service here again and next year's March for Life. But there's going to be at least one thing in the text of the prayers that's going to be different than it's been for the last seven years. We're going to have to take President Obama's name out of there. He's not going to be President of the United States anymore. We're going to be putting the name of a new president into that prayer, those prayers of intercession for next year. And brothers and sisters, because we are not blind, because we know the reality of the violence that's going on, and because we know that standing up for these babies is completely consistent with standing up in compassion and mercy for their mothers, their fathers, and their families, and even for the abortionists, because we know that, we're confident in what we are doing. And that's why we can confidently also go in to the political arena in this election year and elect public servants who know the difference between serving the public and killing the public. And if a public servant does not know the difference between serving the public and killing the public, he or she does not belong in public office. Now, some people will say to you and they'll say to me, the pro-life movement should not be a partisan movement. It should not be promoting any particular party. It should not be discrediting any particular party. It should not be standing for some particular candidate. It should not be standing against a particular candidate. The pro-life movement is supposed to be beyond partisan politics, and so is the church. You can't have in the church some kind of partisan message. The church is not some kind of political party. Brothers and sisters, I fully agree. I absolutely fully agree, and I ask you this, if tomorrow the candidates running for public office and asking for your vote were to all get together, and those who were pro-life were to become pro-choice, and those who were pro-choice were to become pro-life overnight, would anything of your message or my message change? Then how are we partisan? Tomorrow, the Democratic Party becomes pro-life, the Republican Party becomes pro-choice. Tomorrow, announcement is made on the morning news. You tell me what I should say different in this sermon. 
You tell me what you should say different. When you write an article, when some of you who are clergy preach a sermon, what changes? Nothing changes because we don't stand on the platform of the Republican Party. We don't stand on the platform of the Democratic Party. We don't stand on the platform of any party than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you today, if you think for one moment that the gospel of Jesus Christ requires you to be silent when there's a holocaust going around, around you, you got the wrong gospel. You got the wrong idea of what Jesus requires. He does not require silence. He does not require neutrality. He's the opposite of silence. He is the eternal word that speaks up, that speaks forth, that speaks a word into the silence, destroying the silence because he's got to destroy the blindness. He's the light. The gospel can't be preached if we're silent. And he is not neutral. God Almighty is not neutral. As a matter of fact, the God who unites us here today, he is a great unifier. There has hardly been any aspect of the pro-life movement and of the pro-life cause that I have been more passionate about than about unifying this great movement. Bringing together people from ethnic, religious, and even different political backgrounds together in the fight for the most basic principle on which this nation stands, life itself. But I tell you today, God, who is the great unifier, is also the great divider. From the beginning of the scriptures to the end, he is the great divider between light and darkness, truth and error, life and death. You notice what he does at the creation of the world? Read the first chapter of Genesis. What does he do? He divides the light from the darkness. He divides the waters from above the heavens from those below. Dividing the waters from the land, he divides. Precisely so that creation can come to be. He's the great divider. When Elijah stood before the prophets of Baal and the prophet and the people of Israel, he said, stop straddling the fence. Decide today whom you will serve. If it is the Lord, then serve him. If it is Baal, then serve him. But stop trying to straddle along with two opinions. There is no room for neutrality among the followers of the living God. God divides. Jesus Christ said in the end, when the judgment occurs, the king will sit upon his throne and he will do what? What does he say? He will divide. He will separate the people as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. He will divide. Why? Because there is no partnership between life and death. There is no partnership between sin and grace, between truth and falsehood. We must divide them forever. And they will be divided forever, and that's the meaning of the last judgment. <laughs> Division is negative only when it confuses the evil with the person. It's not the people who promote abortion who are evil. It's abortion that's evil. It's not the people who get abortions who are evil. It's the abortions that are evil. And it's not the child in a problem pregnancy who's the problem. The problem manifests itself in many ways. Lack of resources, lack of support, lack of involvement of the father. Whatever the problem is, the problem isn't the child. It is precisely the error of confusing the evil with the person that promotes real division, destructive division. We're the people of unity because unity comes about when the truth is clearly lifted up. When grace and mercy are clearly proclaimed. Because mercy triumphs over judgment. Life triumphs over death. I'm convinced in this movement now, in this year ahead, there will be several key priorities and victories. One, as I already said, we're going to elect public servants who know the difference between serving the public and killing the public. We're going to get out in those voting booths. 
We're going to register voters, we're going to educate voters, we're going to inform them, and we are going to vote them into office. And there's a second thing we're going to do, and this brings us to the honor and the award that we want to present today to the governor, legislators, and people of Kansas who have united around life. The progress we are going to continue to make is the following. We shine a light on this blind spot that continues to exist even among so many of our brothers and sisters who advocate for social justice in so many other ways that we agree with and yet consistently and persistently ignore the unborn, the blind spot that continues in so many of our brothers and sisters who are in leadership in this government, when you hear them speak in favor of abortion, there is something you will never hear them do. You will never hear them describe an abortion. The last thing abortion supporters want to discuss is abortion. They, will, they want to discuss abstract and theoretical concepts. Freedom of choice, the Constitution. They'll get into all kinds of philosophical and even theological debates with us. They don't want to discuss what needs to be the starting point of this debate. What is an abortion? It's amazing when folks like you and me hold up signs showing the reality of what an abortion is or point to videos and images online showing what an abortion is. Isn't it amazing how everybody who sees those images without even hearing us say a word presumes that we're against abortion? But why do they presume that? Maybe we're for abortion and we're trying to advertise it. But the reason why they don't presume that is that those that advertise abortion never want to show what they're selling. They don't even want to admit what they're selling. But why not? This is what I challenge them. Do you think abortion is a good thing or a bad thing? If it's good, you're one heck of a crappy marketer. You're not even talking about your own product. But then again, on the other hand, maybe they're geniuses at marketing. The marketing of the evil one. Present evil as a good. Hide the face of evil. What does scripture tell us in Ephesians 5.11? Have nothing to do with the fruitless works of darkness, but rather expose them. What did our friends in the civil rights movement do? They exposed the evil of segregation. You know what the segregationists did in the protest the first times when they were attacking the peaceful, prayerful civil rights protesters? You know what the first thing was that they attacked? The cameras. They splashed black paint on the lenses of the cameras. Because they didn't want the news media or the American people or the consciences of our brothers and sisters to see the evil of segregation. And so we're, this year, facing some strategic and practical advances in this pro-life cause. And it's been done in Kansas, it's been done in Oklahoma, and it's been introduced in several other states. A measure that describes abortion describes dismemberment abortion. There are various kinds of procedures that involve the dismemberment of the living child in the womb, living child, and then, brothers and sisters, protects those children from that dismemberment. And why is this a good strategic measure at this point in our movement? Because we need to mobilize not just pro-life people. We don't just need to mobilize the folks that are joining us for the March for Life. We also need to mobilize pro-choice people. And how do you do that? Well, because most, even most people who identify with the, themselves with the label pro-choice are not in favor of abortion in the later stages of pregnancy. And when they are told about how some of these procedures work, namely the actual tearing off of the arms, legs, and pieces of the skull, they oppose it. They still keep the pro-choice label. They don't want to see Roe v. Wade reversed. They don't want to see all abortions outlawed. But they will, and they are, joining hands with us to at least protect 
children in later stages of pregnancy and at least protect them from specifically defined violence. What a measure like this does is it brings the evil out from hiding and asks our legislators and the people they represent, do you or do you not believe that these dis children should be able to be dismembered? That's not a difficult argument to make. It's not a, different question, a difficult question to pose. And this legislation poses it, and when you pose it, people answer it the right way. Now we're, we're moving away, brothers and sisters, from the tactic the other side tries to use, abstraction and concealment. No, we bring this procedure out into the light, and that's what Kansas has done. Many of you here today are from Kansas. We've invited you to come. I came to Kansas when Governor Brownback had one of the signing ceremonies for a piece of legislation that protects unborn children in Kansas from dismemberment abortion. And we want to thank him today. We want to thank the legislators who were behind this measure. We want to thank all of the people of Kansas who were behind this measure. Because what you have done is to give a rallying cry to our entire movement, a rallying cry to our entire nation. We start here. Nobody is saying that the children killed by other methods other than dismemberment should be killed. Nobody is saying that any of those other abortions are okay. Nobody in our ranks is saying that. But we are saying you take people from what is most obvious to what is least obvious. You don't start with what is least obvious. Start with what most people will agree on and then move it forward from there. Some people will, will object. Let me be very explicit about this and we'll call up the governor. Some people will say, yes, but every baby is a person. Every abortion is equally wrong. So you people are wrong for focusing just on one aspect of this. We turn their argument right back on them. You believe in the personhood of every single unborn child, so do we. And it's precisely because we believe in the personhood of the children who are about to be dismembered that when we can protect them now, we must. We must. We cannot wait. People will say to us, oh, but you can't wait. You can't wait. We got to protect them all now. And we're saying, you can't wait. You can't wait. You got to protect them now, everyone you possibly can. And that's why we introduce measures like this. The children who can be saved today don't have a right to life that depends on our ability to save the other ones. Their right to life is independent of that. Their right to life towers above any limitations we have on saving the rest of the children. We are going to save them all. We are going to see the end of abortion. We are going to see the protection of every unborn child. But brothers and sisters, to get there, we must move now. We can't sit back and wait in some kind of idealistic bubble. We move now, and Kansas has moved. And the nation will continue to move. And we're going to work today to urge every state to take the example according to its own opportunities and its own possibilities. Because politics and legislative activity is very practical. We, take, uh, we examine the possibilities and we move forward where we can move. And therefore, at this time, I would like to invite our friend, Governor Sam Brownback of Kansas, to come forward.